Welcome to the Retreat Leaders Podcast, your sanctuary with retreat experts, where we spill the tea on retreat success. Here we dive into crafting transformational guest experiences, talk about how to avoid pitfalls, and unlock marketing secrets. Whether you're a seasoned guru or a budding enthusiast, we've got the inside scoop for you. Join us as we learn how to flourish in this magical world of retreats. Hey guys, welcome to the Retreat Leaders Podcast. It's Shannon, and I am so excited about our guest today because we are going to chat about something that I think is crucial to success in anything that you do. But since we're talking primarily to retreat leaders, it's definitely important for us as this market keeps growing and the market is changing and trends are changing and times are changing. And so this, what we're going to talk about today, though, is solid and it lasts through all of the changes. So welcome, Jeff, to the show. Hey, thank you, Shannon, for having me on. I am so excited you're here. Why don't you start off first by telling everyone about yourself? Like, who are you and what brought you to this point in your life? I'm just a normal guy, an average guy, but I've had a magical life in business and, you know, just I've been blessed. Now, it's not because I'm smart. I came across something about 30 years ago that changed everything for me. And you shouldn't be surprised by this because anything you try to do, it's hard in the beginning until someone takes mercy on you and kind of shows you the trick. There's a trick to everything. And somebody took mercy on me at the age of 33 and shared something with me that has made my life a lot easier and a lot more successful ever since. So, hey, without that, I wouldn't have one thing of value to share with your audience, but that's what I'm going to share with whoever's listening today. Okay, now you have to tell us what this is, because I'm super (laughs) intrigued. (laughs) Well, I came across this trick, if you will, because I did something that I knew was wrong. I complained to a very successful woman. She and her husband were everything I wanted to be, but I saw no path at all to get to where they were. They were very wealthy. They were remodeling these beautiful old homes and making a ton of money doing it. And I looked up to them in every way. Now, just to give you a little context, the only way I met them was I was a concrete contractor And I was pouring concrete in one of the backyards of a home they were remodeling and getting ready for sale. These two were different. You know, I did a lot of work, poured a lot of concrete, and for a lot of wealthy people, and rarely did they ever come out and hobnob with us or talk to us. They just wanted us to go to work, get out of there. But these two were special. They were just really elegant, wonderful, kind people. And one morning I had a chance to talk to her, but the conversation devolved, started out positive enough. I fell back into my old shtick of complaining about how unfair life was. That, you know, I would tell anyone who would listen that I work harder than anyone I know. And yet, Some of these guys have wealthy dads who set them up and they're driving around in BMWs and not hardly working at all. And in the middle of that, Shannon, she just turned around and walked off. No way. Yeah, it was so (laughs) embarrassing. I thought, duh, you know, wealthy, smart people, they don't want to listen to your belly aching. But she came back a few minutes later and handed me what I now call a manuscript, but at the time it was just a stack of papers clipped together. And she said, read this tonight and bring it back to me in the morning. This manuscript told the story of a real man in history who lived in the 1300s. This is Sultan Musa of Mali, one of the wealthiest men to ever live. And just to put it in context, If you combine the wealth of Jeff Bezos, who you know about, and Elon Musk, you get close to Sultan Musa of Mali, but you don't catch him. Wow. He's still ahead. And he lived clear back, like I said, in the 1300s in West Africa. He started out dirt poor. And I won't go into all the story, but 
he survived an attempt on his life at the age of 12. He was recruited by an older thief because he had become a pretty good thief. He had to steal food to eat. His mother, once his dad died, it plunged them into poverty. She couldn't even guarantee him one meal a day. So that was his life. He was a petty thief. And he pulled off this giant heist with the older thief that would have made him very wealthy, except the older thief wasn't ever planning to share the wealth with little 12-year-old Musa. And he sealed him in a cave and left him to die, which he did. Basically, he had a near-death experience, and it's this, what he learned in the near-death experience that he wrote extensively about, that's how he changed his life and became one of the wealthiest men ever before he became sultan. One of the reasons that he was appointed sultan is he was already independently wealthy. So the current sultan, who was going to leave for a while, didn't have to worry that Musa would you know, take his wealth and then have him killed or anything like that. And everybody loved Musa. He was incredibly benevolent, kind, generous. And basically, he just fell in love with the character he met during his near-death experience that he called, and this is the only way he referred to him, a man made of light and love who taught him all these crazy things. Well, these crazy things were in the manuscript. And what if I told you that there is a language that you're speaking right now, but it has nothing to do with words coming out of your mouth? And Musa called this language the language of the gods. And he said, anything you say in this language, the world obeys your command. Well, I'm reading this. And when I first started reading about it, he's talking about it and how it changed his life. I'm thinking, well, surely, you know, he's not going to explain how to actually speak it. But there it was in like the next paragraph, exactly how to speak it. And I'm going to tell you the second I read it, I knew it was true. I knew that's how it worked. And I could see it in others as plain as day. But we're all creatures of habit. We all have these subconscious beliefs that make us who we are. They give us our personality. And so I was afraid to try it. And looking back, the reason I was afraid is because I had no hope at the time. I was stuck in a dead end, very difficult business or trade. I was working myself into the ground. I was still going backwards a little bit financially. Things were falling apart at home because all I did was work. I never did anything fun with my wife or the kids. Holidays meant nothing to me, you know, except maybe Christmas, Easter, the big ones. But any other holiday, I, that was just a work day. And I worked six days a week and just was not fun to be married to. I never helped out with the kids. I needed something to change. So I tried this. And everything I spoke this language about changed. Hey, retreat leaders. Are your retreats the hidden gems of the travel world just waiting to be discovered? Well, it's time to shine a spotlight on them. Introducing the ultimate guide you've been waiting for. Our free guide, Top 11 Tips for Building an Email List for you, the retreat leaders. Imagine an email list packed with eager attendees, hanging on to your every word and ready to book at the click of a button. We share the blueprint to creating a list that sells. Don't miss out on the action. Learn how to connect deeply with your audience, boost your bookings, and create a buzz that fills every retreat. Whether you're a seasoned pro or just starting out, These 11 tips are your secret weapon to success. Visit retreatleaderlistbuilding.com now to grab your free copy and start building an email list that sells out your retreats. I'm going to tell your audience how to speak this language. I'm not going to hold anything back. And you do not have to take my word for anything I say here. 
if you start speaking this language, it doesn't matter what aspect of your life, finances, your relationship, how people treat you, your level of fitness, it doesn't matter. Whatever you say in this language, that's the way it's going to be. Well, of course, we're all enthralled right now. <laughs> I mean, I cannot wait to hear what this is. I have to say, like, you know, you describing where you were in your life at that point, and even the way you described the conversation, how you were just complaining and going on and on at first with this woman, it reminds me of what I see in our industry, complaining about the economy, complaining about how they didn't get enough signups or enough business or complaining about how, whatever it is, like, it's like we're this big complaint world. So I am so curious how you took that state of mind that you were in, read something and then flipped the script. I can't wait. When you hear this, you're going to see it so clearly. Not so much in yourself, although indirectly you're going to be like, oh yeah, I am for sure telling people how they can treat me. I accept certain things and then I don't accept other things. And that's on me because you know I've got a sister-in-law who you would not dare say that to. She will claw your eyes out. She will not accept that. But I do. Why? All right, wait till you hear this. So I got to tell you one other thing about Sultan Musa Mali. Besides the fact he was very benevolent, he just wanted to be like this man made of light and love that he met. He was incredibly generous. He wrote extensively, not for him. He already knew what to do, how to change his life, how to make his life what he wanted it to be. And one of the first things he learned was that he not only had the ability, but he had the authority. You get to design your life. Now, we think it's all happenstance, but I'm telling you, anything you say in this language, that's the way it is for you, your physical world. And if you change what you say, your physical situation will change to match. There's nothing you can do or anyone else can do to stop that change from happening. And just to give you a taste of what happened to me, I went from making like 60000 a year, which I could kind of get by on, but I started making three times that much every single month in a business that just came to me. It fell into my lap. I was perfect at it. The perfect business partner came to me, and that's what this is all about. Everyone in your audience wants something or more of something. That's why they're tuning in. They're hoping they'll learn something today that gets them what they want. Those things are already out there. They already exist. That perfect sweetheart for you, he or she is already out there, and they want to find you as bad as you want to find them. If you're already in a marriage, the solution to your problems exists. It's out there. The trick is getting your past across. How do you get that solution to come to you? How do you get it to come to your partner? Because maybe that's who has to see a video or talk to somebody who says, hey, if you don't get off this path, it's going to be bad. Well, how do you make that happen? It's so simple that it actually made me a little mad at first that I didn't see it a lot earlier and suffered needlessly. But don't worry about that because any frustration you've felt up to now is the foundation of why you will try this, why you will be willing to learn something new. And as soon as you try it, you're going to see that it works. And here's how you're going to know. Things will start happening that weren't happening a month ago or a year ago, and you will think of them as coincidences. And you'll at first write them off. Well, it's just a coincidence. That would have happened anyway. So it's not going to be on the first one or maybe even the 10th one that you say to yourself, I did that. I'm doing that. I'm causing these changes. People are treating me differently because of the way I'm speaking this language. So we have to jump into this language right now. Or people are going to start getting frustrated, like, Jeff, just tell us, you know. <laughs> so here we go. Sultan Musa of Mali, also, I told you he wrote extensively. 
He wrote a fairy tale and embedded the secrets in the fairy tale. And then he wrote a second parchment that detailed everything. It, it talked about, I mean, it gave a tutorial on exactly how to speak the language of the gods. It explained what it is. But he wrote the fairy tale to preserve his own life. You got to think of in the 1300s, he was in an Islamic country. You didn't just go around talking about, hey, I died yesterday, but then I came back to life and I met basically God who taught me how the world works. And it goes contrary to what our scholars think is how it works. I mean, that is a quick way to get in a lot of trouble, maybe even killed. It's said of him, by the way, that he started construction on a new school every Friday. And in these schools, he taught these principles, and he single-handedly ended the wars in the Mali kingdom and lifted the entire kingdom out of poverty. They became very wealthy, happy, healthy, loving, helpful to each other, peaceful, all because of him. Prior to him, it was a mess. So this fairy tale is Aladdin and the magic lamp. And to explain the language of the gods and how it works, I'm going to go through the three main characters or elements of this fairy tale. Now, Antoine Gallant was absolutely honest about the fact that he did not write Aladdin and the Magic Lamp. He just translated it from ancient Arabic texts written by Sultan Musa of Mali. So let's start with the first element. You have Aladdin, the main character. Aladdin represents you and me. It's that part of you that you think of as you. It's the conscious mind. Okay, then you have this all-powerful genie who can get you anything you want if you know how to summon it, how to talk to it, how to command it. And it only says two things. The first is a question. What is wanted? What do you want? Then you tell it in this language, and it says, your wish is my command. And it goes and does it. The all-powerful genie represents something Musa called the veiled mind. But we're all familiar with the concept of a subconscious mind. And we basically know the subconscious mind is the mechanism that really runs our lives. It feeds us our thoughts and our fears and our feelings, and we act on those. And it keeps our life congruent with the role it believes we're playing. And I'll come back to that in a minute. But let's move to the best element of the story, right? This is the magic lamp that changes everything for little Aladdin. It changed everything for Musa, and it changed everything for me. The magic lamp represents this language of the gods, but what it really represents is a piece of knowledge, some understanding about how it all works and how you can seize control of the communication that's always taking place between the conscious and subconscious minds. Because it's the conscious mind that is in charge. The conscious mind has the authority to tell the genie how to set the stage of your life. The problem is you've been trained through the years, you know, watching your parents, watching aunt and uncle, you know, June and Jill and Jim to believe that you deserve to be treated a certain way, either good or bad, or that you deserve a certain amount of money, or that you're the type of person who can make money or can't. And you believe it. You're dedicated to this role, but you can change it in an instant. Hey, it's Shannon here. I'm just popping in really quickly to ask a big favor. Would you pause the show and go review it for us? please. Reviews really help us to be able to get more guests and more experts on the show to help you transform your retreats. So if you wouldn't mind pausing and leaving us a review, that would mean everything. And if you're not already subscribed, do that too. The language of the gods is feelings. 
It's not words. It's not thoughts. Thoughts indirectly influence it, but it's feelings. Don't skip over this because there's been a lot of stuff out there lately, especially where people talk about feelings. Uh, you got to get in the feeling place of the thing you want. And while that's true, they leave off really how you do it. So here's the point. You've heard the saying, if you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. But it's more accurate to say that if you feel on a deep core subconscious level that you can or you feel you can't, you are absolutely right. That's the way it's going to be. So how do you change your feelings? Let's say you, here's a great way to know how you feel on a core level. When you wake up tomorrow morning, you're going to instantly and habitually start thinking about your life. Might be money, might be the first thing you think about, your job, whether you like it or hate it, how your relationship is, whether you feel loved on your terms or, or not, and you're just putting up with whatever. You're going to realize that every morning, the same thoughts come to you and the same feelings associated with those thoughts and images. And a lot of your life is wonderful, but there are some things that you'd like to change, right? How do you do it? Well, you change the way you feel. So if right now you wake up and you think, oh, I am so afraid of money or I'm afraid of the future. I'm afraid of my future with the company. I don't know if I'm going to have a job in a year. And you feel afraid, write that down. Now, what you're going to do, that is the language of the gods. Whatever you say in this language, remember, it's the way it's going to be. And I know you're thinking, well, wait a minute, it's the other way around. You know, if my spouse doesn't treat me right and she's cold to me and aloof and, and I can't seem to connect with her, that's why I feel bad about my relationship. No, it's exactly the other way around. You believe on a core level that that's what you deserve, that that's how you're supposed to be treated. Maybe because, you know, mom treated dad that way or whatever. You believe it. You feel it. And those feelings are literal commands to the mechanism that controls your life. And it simply says, your wish is my command. And that's the way it's going to be until you change what you're saying in feelings not words, not thoughts. And here's how you do it. If you haven't been listening yet, listen very intently right now, because this is how you can prove to yourself that this is how it works. And once you do that, you can't unsee this. You have the trick. You can seize control of any aspect of your life. Every one of us was born with the innate ability to imagine and pretend. It's how you've learned everything. And I'll throw in imitate because part of that is seeing others and discerning. Oh, I like that, or I don't like that, or I want to be treated like that, or, or whatever it is, or I want to have that kind of a, a career. Then you imitate, and you did this as a school kid. You know, you'd go to school, dress the way mom thought you'd look cute, you know, but then you get to school and find out. Oh, crap. The popular kids aren't wearing these slacks. They're all wearing jeans and you know tennis shoes. And I got some hard Sunday shoes on. What happens, man? You go home immediately. Mom, I don't want to wear these stupid shoes. I need some kicks, you know, and you get her to dress you right. You go to school looking better. Why? Well, just because the kids you admire are doing that and you want to imitate them and be like them. And I won't spend much time on this, but you do it all the way through. I mean, as you get older and you go into the workforce and you're at the job, you want to fit in. And so you do, and you're very good at this, by the way, you adapt so that you can fit in to the crowd you want to fit in with. And then you start dating and, oh my gosh, you change so that you'll be attractive to the kind of mate that you want. And you do this throughout your whole life. So you're good at this. You're also good at pretending you were born pro. 
So as a kid, you could get lost in a make-believe world and all the other kids would join in. You know, if you said, hey, I'm a princess and, uh, you know, this fallen log is my white horse that I ride around on. Well, the other kids didn't say, hey, are you crazy? That's, that's not a horse. It's a log. What are you doing? No, they all fell in line. They all started making their own declarations. Okay, well, then I'm the prince and I own this territory. And you'd play for hours doing that. But as soon as you got to school, sometimes even sooner, you were taught to quit doing it. But let me ask you a question. Why did you do that as a kid? Shannon, why did you pretend and get lost in a pretend make-believe world? Can you think of one reason why you did that? It felt good. It was fun. It was fun and it felt great. Yeah. Many of your subconscious core beliefs were set during those hours of childhood play. Now, you quit doing that. Because when you went to school, you heard things like, Shannon, get your head out of the clouds. Quit looking out the window. You got to get with the program. Live in the real world, right? But I'm telling you right now, your power is in your ability to imagine and to pretend to the point that it changes how you feel. So here's how you do it you get lost in a make believe imaginary scenario about any aspect of your life until you feel good. Let's take money. Let's say you don't have enough in the physical realm. You don't have enough money. And if you think about your physical realm, you start to get scared. You got more bills, more problems than you have income. But let's say you take five minutes today and you just imagine Having a chest full of cash, and that thing is huge, like four feet tall, six feet wide, four feet deep, full of cash. And you just imagine, just for fun, not to try to change anything or force the world to change, but you get in there with your hands and you rummage through the cash. And maybe you imagine taking 10 of those $10,000 packets and going and buying the car you want. And you imagine, get lost in driving that car around. Okay, for five minutes, you can feel what it's like to be wealthy. Now, I told you earlier, feelings are self-fulfilling prophecies because they're literal commands to the mechanism that has to make your life congruent with your predominant feelings. So they're self-fulfilling prophecies. So let's say you spend five minutes feeling good about money. And that feels so good that you do it for 10 minutes tomorrow. And then you get to the point where you're doing it a lot. Like you're lost in this daydream where you have this vision of yourself wealthy running in the back of your mind, even as you go through your mundane physical tasks at work where, you know, you're not the boss, you're not making 200,000 a month, but you feel wealthy and I'm going to leave it with this question, kind of a statement and a question. First, the question, when is the last time that you felt what it's like to be really wealthy, rich, to have tons of money coming in, plenty of money? When's the last time you felt what that's like? When is the last time you felt what it's like to be loved on your terms, the way you want to be loved, the way you want to be cared for. When is the last time you felt lean, healthy, strong, vibrant, energetic? Now, if the answer to any of those questions and, you know, a handful more that I could ask about other aspects of your life is, yeah, it's been a long time, Jeff, or maybe never. I've never felt what it's like to be absolutely healthy and fit and strong. So you have to understand that you cannot expect the mechanism that controls your life, your subconscious mind, and just trust me, it does. It is running the show. You can't expect it to create a life for you or situations and circumstances for you that you've never commanded it to create 
in the only language it listens to and obeys. Change your feelings, change your life, use your imagination and your ability to build an imaginary pretend world all around you, a make-believe world, get lost in that until you feel what it's like, you know, create the perfect sweetheart who treats you exactly the way you want to be treated and feel what it's like through your imagination. By the way, your subconscious mind doesn't differentiate between experiences you have in the quote unquote real world or experiences you generate out of whole cloth with your imagination. And just because it's important to understand this, because your subconscious mind, again, it's about congruency. It consults your past experiences to chart your future. So you can embed experiences into the record that weren't there yesterday, and you can just do it with your imagination. Now, you're already doing that in case you think, well, that's weird. That shouldn't be the case. No, two people can experience the same thing and have a very different point of view about what happened because they're filling in details they don't know. They're adding things based on their experience and they're doing all of that. They're imagining what probably happened, what it probably means. They're giving value to it based on imagination. This resonates. Oh, go ahead. Now, I was just going to say this. This resonates so much with the work that I do for myself when it comes, I call it mindset, but it's, I think it's, we're speaking the same language to a degree. About eight years ago, just to give you a practical example, about eight years, maybe a little longer, my husband and I wanted to move to a lake house, but we had so many obstacles in our way of selling our businesses and selling things. But I was like, you know what? We flew out to this community. We went and previewed homes. I got excited being in the homes. I wanted to feel what it would feel like to live in this lake community. And we spent almost three or four days doing this. We flew back home. And then every day I would peruse the houses. And one day I found a house. I was like, oh my gosh, I love this one. I happened to print it, put it on my vision board. A year and a half later, Jeff, that's the home we moved into. That's that a home. miracle. That's a that miracle, home. right? Yeah. And so I tell retreat leaders all the time, sit down and imagine your retreat full of people that you want to work with and that there's financial abundance there, but literally sit and imagine it, draw it out, print it out, stare at it, feel it. And so I resonate with this so much. It's the same thing with our retreat center that I'm here at now. This was just in my imagination. And then we built out this 46 acre retreat center all from my imagination. I literally used to sit in my home office and picture myself walking these grounds, even though I didn't know it was going to be these grounds. You know what I mean? Right. So this resonates so much. Okay. You're already doing innately just because, you know, you've learned and tried some things and realized, you know, this is a good way to live. It's not only, it seems to be productive. It seems to produce miracles, but it's also the most fun way to live that I've ever come across. So now that you know, and by the way, I'm going to tell your audience where they can download my book, The Sultan's Seven Secrets, because I put everything in there and you can download it absolutely free. I just want everybody to have it. And you can be speaking the language of the gods in a very effective way tonight and all day tomorrow. And I promise you, if you do, your circumstances will change. You change the way you feel, your life is going to change. The physical will catch up to what I call uh, your psyche, but it's what's going on in your heart and in your head, that movie that's running in the back of your mind. You've set new subconscious beliefs when you do this, and your life has to be congruent with those deep beliefs. So change those. You've just changed your life. Hey guys, I'm popping in to ask a quick question. Are you ready to elevate your marketing game and fill those retreat slots faster than ever? Of course you are. That's why you're here. And we've got the toolkit for you. Our top five marketing tools for retreat leaders guide. 
This isn't just a guide. It's your marketing guru wrapped up in one easy-to-follow package. Dive into the essentials of social media marketing, where we show you how to leverage those platforms to create a community buzzing with excitement for your retreats. Also, unleash the power of content marketing with strategies that educate and engage your potential guests. Plus, we'll dive into email marketing, SEO, and partnership opportunities that open new doors and bring in streams of attendees. So why wait to make your retreats the talk of the town? Download your free guide today by visiting retreatmarketingtools.com and start transforming your retreat dreams into reality. And I don't want you to take my word for this, but you're going to see the evidence pop up. And I have to tell you how you're going to notice. Again, we talked about little coincidences popping up. Okay, if you change how you feel about finances, for example, something is going to happen. Your subconscious mind is going to go find a circumstance that matches those feelings. It may not match the imagery you're using, like the pirate chest full of cash. You may never have one of those because that kind of be stupid, too easy to steal all your wealth, you know, just throw that in the back of a pickup and they're gone. But if you imagine having all that wealth, you're going to feel wealthy. And then something is going to happen. Low-hanging fruit first. Grandma might swing by and just say, hey, I'm handing out, you know, I've liquidated something and I'm handing out checks to all the kids. And here's 20 grand. Well, that wasn't happening a year ago. That didn't happen yesterday. It happened now that you're doing this. And the feelings that you will experience when grandma gives you 20 grand will match the feelings you've been producing with your imagination, if you take this seriously, and you can identify those feelings. It's like something came to me kind of effortlessly. It came to me. I didn't have to go dig it up, find it, figure it out. It just came to me. And it was easy. And it makes me feel wealthy. It makes me feel like I've got more, plenty. Those coincidences, if you keep doing this, will keep happening. They will never stop. Once you command your subconscious mind in the language of feelings that you're supposed to be wealthy, it will go find that perfect business partner that has half of a business and you've got the other half of a $20 million a year business. It will go set up the circumstances. And all you have to do is follow the new nudges it's going to start sending you. These are thoughts, notions, feelings, emotions, and you act on these anyway. So you don't have to worry, well, what if I don't follow them? No, you will, because you act on your thoughts and feelings. And it will change your thoughts and feelings to lead you like a little bull with a ring in its nose right to where it now believes you're supposed to be based on your different feelings. I love it. That's it. I love it. So tell everyone, I'll have it linked in the show notes too, but Jeff, tell everyone as we wrap up here, where can they get your free book and where can they contact you? If maybe they, I don't know, they want to work with you or deepen this work. Talk to me. All right. So I do all kinds of things, uh, challenges and events and speaking engagements. and But the way to find out where those are and to take the next step, you start with the free video book. You download that by going to sultans7secrets.com. That's uh, sultans with an S at the beginning and the end, sultans7, the, spelled out the word seven, secrets with an S at the beginning and the end, dot com. And you can download the book absolutely free. It's a video book. So it's my little face will pop up and I'll I'll read the book to you. The name of the book, if you want to buy it, is Sultan's Seven Secrets. It's actually the Sultan's Seven Secrets. It tells the story of how I learned all about this, what happened to me when I put it into practice, but also... Sultan Musa of Mali was heavy on concepts, but he didn't give me the games and the tricks and the, you know, the things I used to 
change my feelings. And so those are in the book too. Awesome. That is and so Sultan, awesome. Sultan7secrets.com. Download it. Change your life. I love it. I will have all of what he said linked in the show notes. Jeff, thank you so much for this incredibly powerful message. Hopefully retreat leaders are taking this and going, I could just imagine and play to change my feelings in order to be successful at what they do. So thank you so very much, Jeff. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Shannon. Really appreciate coming on. And if you want to do round two and get into tricks and techniques and hacks, I'd love to do it anytime. Sounds awesome. Thanks for listening to the Retreat Leaders Podcast. Learn more at www.theretreatranch.com. See you next time.